guys, nobody's in front of me. I can put my feet down. Doc? It's, um, what's her name? That was, um, yeah, that, that was that girl. Is he exercising his face? Whoa. Atlantis, you can do this again, boy. Now this time, don't sin. Is that one still on his face? Civilians in there.
Is she coming down? Say that louder. Say it. They're making the they're making the International Space Station or the ISS. Thank you. She is beautiful with a bark. What are you going to do? Oh, my Canadian buds. Those MMs. What's that? The aurora. What's that? The aurora. Yeah, what is that? It's, like it's found in the North Pole. It's like the sky is shining to different lights. Oh, that thing that you see in the Polar Express? Yeah. Oh. Oh, it's Alan Shepard. Continued. I think that was the show. Oh, yeah, we're about to have the training part. The training look. Because it's too far. They're about to do. They're about to do a training part. What? Well, good morning. We'd like to uh, like to welcome you all here to the John F. Kennedy Space Center. <laughs> My name is Nick Thomas. I'm a student here at ASC, and today we want to bring you up to date on the current level of activity here at Kennedy across the agency. We also want to tell you about NASA's plans to return Americans to the moon. Let's start off with an overview of the Cape Canaveral KSC complex. We're located on Merritt Island right here at the visitor's complex, along with the vehicle assembly building and launch pad 39A and B. Over here to the east is Cape Canaveral, where we launch the majority of our unmanned rockets. Now, we currently launch four types of unmanned rockets from Cape Canaveral and KSC. <clears throat> Over on the Cape, on Pad 37, we fly the Delta IV. Meanwhile, the Atlas V flies from Pad 41, the Falcon 9 from Pad 40 and Pad 39A, and the Falcon Heavy also flies from Pad 39A. Our next launch is now scheduled for December the 4th, 
that will be a Falcon 9 rocket taking off from Launch Pad 40, and the rocket will carry a resupply ship to the International Space Station. Coming up on December 17th, we have NASA 5 scheduled for launch from Launch Pad 41, and that rocket will carry an unmanned Boeing Starliner, which will dock with the International Space Station. And coming up in February, we have NASA 5 scheduled for launch from Pad 41, and that rocket will carry a probe known as the Solar Orbiter. Now, currently, the focus of our manned spaceflight effort continues to be the International Space Station. Here we see the station orbiting above the Earth at an altitude of 250 miles and traveling around the Earth at a speed of 17,500 miles per hour. That's 10 times faster than a rifle bullet. We started building the space station back in 1998 and completed construction in 2011. We put our first crew on board the station back in 2000, so for the past 19 years, we've had a continuous human presence in Earth orbit. Now getting crews to and from the station has been the job of the Soyuz vehicle and Soyuz launches from Kazakhstan. This is the launch of a Soyuz rocket with a beautiful view of the moon in the background. And here on the right, the Soyuz vehicle in orbit made up of three components, the orbital module, the crew module, and the propulsion module. We currently have six people living on board the space station, and Russian and uh, Italian astronaut Luca Parmentano is our current station commander. And now let's take a closer look at what's currently happening on board the International Space Station. Welcome to Space to Ground. I'm Leah Cheshire. This week, astronauts continued specialized spacewalks to repair a cosmic ray detector, helping us understand beyond what we can see. On November 22nd, NASA astronaut Andrew Morgan and European Space Agency astronaut Luca Parmitano suited up to spend a day in the vacuum of space. The duo completed the second of four planned spacewalks to repair the alpha magnetic spectrometer, an experiment that sifts through cosmic ray particles and determines their characteristics. The astronauts used tools developed specifically to complete out-of-the-ordinary spacewalk tasks, like cutting through stainless steel tubes. The astronauts will conduct two more spacewalks to continue repairs on the AMS, providing additional years of research into the secrets of our universe. Boeing's Starliner spacecraft was on a roll this week, preparing for its maiden voyage to the International Space Station in December. As one of our commercial crew partners, Boeing is approaching the first flight of its Starliner crew vehicle, which rolled out to the launch pad at Kennedy Space Center on November 21st. Starliner will first make an uncrewed flight to the space station in December and return to Earth to test all its systems before transporting astronauts next year. The commercial crew program will allow NASA the capability to launch astronauts to the station from American soil, the first flights to do so since the retirement of the space shuttle in 2011. This week's question is from Michelle of Year 3 students, who asked about the space station's speed and if Earth is in view while the astronauts are outside the hatch. The space station orbits Earth at around 17,500 miles per hour, treating astronauts on board to about 16 sunrises and sunsets each day. When those astronauts go out on a spacewalk, they get a magnificent view of the Earth below. And if you watch the broadcast, you too might catch a glimpse of our home planet from their helmet camera. Keep sending in your questions using the hashtag AskNASA. We'll see you next week. Now, in 2014, NASA entered into contracts with two private companies to provide human access to the space station. Those contractors are Boeing with the Starliner and SpaceX with the Crew Dragon. Now, we've already seen the first unmanned test flight of the SpaceX vehicle. Back in May, an unmanned Crew Dragon docked with the station, and coming up on December 17th, an unmanned Boeing Starliner will perform the same type of mission. Next up for SpaceX, a manned flight of the Dragon vehicle with astronauts Doug Hurley and Bob Beckham. Heavy supplies at this station is a very important job, and that job is now being performed by four different vehicles. We have the ATV from Japan, from the United States and Northrop Grumman, we have the Cygnus cargo ship. Russia has their progress resupply vehicle, and again from the United States by way of SpaceX, we have the Dragon. Now, three of these vehicles can only carry supplies up to the station. They can't bring anything home 
because they all burn up in the atmosphere of power reduction. Tracking is equipped with a heat shield and is capable of bringing over 40,000 pounds of supplies and medical experiments back home to the Earth. Dragon also comes home by parachute, but lands in the ocean. And he was eaten with a of dragon cattle just off the coast of Baja California. Now, a part enterprise continues to extend its reach into the area of low Earth orbit. NASA is again turning toward deep space exploration, human exploration. And the next step in that goal is the Artemis program. NASA's plan to return Americans to the moon by 2024. Let's listen to William Shatner describes this exciting new program. this program is our new deep space vehicle called Orion. Now Orion flew her first unmanned test flight back in 2014, and on that flight the spacecraft achieved an orbital altitude of 3,600 miles, and then was sent roaring back in the atmosphere at speeds in excess of 20,000 miles per hour. Same feat we'll see coming back home from the moon and from Mars. Now this same vehicle, the Orion EFT-1, 
It's now on display here at the Visitor's Complex. You'll find it located over the our next building in an exhibit that we call That's and Now. So please be sure to go by and visit this remarkable street track. Now the EFT One Flight is very important because it allows us to take our next step in the program. This is our next Orion capsule already made through its service module, and it's being prepared for a flight called Artemis One. Now this will be another <laughs> test flight, and it will be a vision block or a weather drone. No one's recording, but my job. Allowing it to fly on top of what will become the world's most powerful rocket. This is an artist's conception of the Space Launch System, standing out on Launch Pad 39B. Now, one glance in this vehicle will tell you that there is a lot of heritage technology from the Shuttle program. The two solid rocket boosters are very similar to what we flew on the Shuttle. The first stage of the rocket is actually a modified external fuel tank from the Shuttle program. And on the bottom of that first stage, we'll have four upgraded Space Shuttle main engines. But perhaps the most critical design change on this vehicle can be found at the very top. The tractor rocket you see up here is called the Launch Avoid System. And that system is capable of carrying the capsule and crew away from the rocket in the event of a launch emergency or the emergency in the early phase of the powered flight. So this vehicle comes with a positive seat ending right off the launch pad. Now this is what flight operations will look like one day at a launch pad at 39 b I can't see your face. <laughs> Why? Now, here at the Kennedy Space Center, we're in the process of converting ourselves into a 21st century launch complex. A lot of people think because the shuttle program is ended, the Kennedy Space Center has closed down. Nothing even further from the truth. Now, to give you an idea of some of the work going on out here, at a launch pad 39B, pouring down all the shuttle launch towers, 
and we pulled out over 1.8 million feet of cable and wiring, and we replaced it all with fiber optics. All we need to do for getting that pad is being supported the new Space Launch System. A pad 39A Space Access and Furbishet facility getting ready for flights of the Falcon rocket and crew Dragon Daniel, which will carry astronauts to and from the space station. No more Cape Canaveral at Pad 41, we constructed a crew access tower. And that will be used by astronauts flying on board Boeing Starlight. Again, flights to and from the station. Now, in keeping with this program, just recently, we took the mobile launcher for the space launch system, and we rolled that whole assembly out to launch pad 39B for a continuing series of fit checks and validations. So you can see there's a lot of work going on under the radar screen here at Kennedy, getting us ready for what we think will be a very vibrant future. Now this year, we celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Apollo program. And it's this month of November, we take time out to remember the crew that made the second manned lunar landing. On November 14, 1969, the crew of Apollo 12, Pete Conrad, Dick Gordon, and Alan Bean, launched on board their 7-5 wheel rocket to perform a pinpoint landing in the ocean of storms. Conrad and Bean landed their lunar module only 500 feet away from the old Soviet Air 3 spacecraft. So once again, this month we celebrate the crew of Apollo 12, Pete Conrad, Dick Gordon, and Alan Bean. NASA is present on the World Wide Web, as well as being present on the newer social networking media of Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and Flickr. But for right now, if you have any questions about Kennedy Space Center or any of our operations, please feel free to go ahead and raise your hand. We'll be glad to try to answer those questions for you. Yes, sir. Yeah, those big giant bumps, or craters as we call them, were caused by meteors and meteorites striking the moon over millions and millions of years. So that's where those, uh, that's where those craters come from. Yeah. Um, how long would it, how long do you think it would take for NASA um, to get to Mars? Right now, uh, with current propulsion, it would take about six to nine months to get to Mars. You have to stay on the surface for about a year and a half while the planets realign to their point of closest approach and then it'll be another six to nine months coming back home. So you're looking at about a three year long round trip with current propulsion. Um, like, but able to get there, because we're not able to get there yet, are we? No, uh, not people, not yet, but that's what we're projecting, yeah. How much robots are on the Mars? Uh, we've got several robots, uh, rovers on the surface of Mars. There's uh, some from the United States, there's one from yeah. India, and I believe there's a couple from the uh, from Russia. So yeah, there's a number of uh, robot rovers on the moon right now. Any other questions? Well then, in just about 10 minutes, we'll be joined on the stage by astronaut Norm Peck. Norm is a veteran of the Space Shuttle Program. He's going to share those intentions with you. So answer your questions. And then, the conclusion of this presentation, he'll be available for photographs with you out in the lobby. But in the meantime, we want to thank you all very much for coming by today, and we hope you enjoy your day today here at the John F. Kennedy Space Center. Thanks very much. But, but what time is he coming out? Question. But what time is he coming out? We better get moving. We don't. Like, in 10 minutes, they're going to have a real They're going to have a, have a, vet, have a, vet, a veteran at Ask Not. Yeah. And thank you, Frank. Thank you. Good question. Thank you. Talking about something about like the NASA now. Can you go there? Um, I think we. I'm gonna be ending the video right now, but I will have a virtual up and it will be uploaded to me. But yeah.